Hi, welcome to the March meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society. And I'm laughing because I psyched myself out of recording like twice before I started the recording. So that's it. This is it. This is the take. This is live. I'm Rowan. Um, I am enjoying the cloudy day so that you don't have to look at me backlit. Um, and between the time change and technical difficulties, we are running a little bit uh, shorthanded this month, which is fine because all you want to do is listen to me run my mouth, right? Yeah, no, definitely not. Um, so we're going to actually change up the format uh, for the first time this year, and we have a bunch of stuff planned for the for later in the year, like panels and and, and group discussions and and stuff that is a, a less Rowan talks at you for an hour format, which is great because y'all, since the pandemic, I do not talk for an hour straight anymore, and my voice wears out. But so what we're going to do is we're going to actually unpin me from the giant square in the center of the screen, and and have a little back and forth with uh, one of our other editors, Christine, who coincidentally happens to be my writing partner, um, so who is very, very familiar with everything I'm about to talk about, because I talk about it at her all the time, I, with, with, I talk about it with her. Um, Christine, would you say this is an at or a with? A little of both, actually, 50-50. Yeah, yeah, a little, <laughs> little bit of both. Um, we will have the usual animal cameos. The big dog is down in her crate here. The kittens are not in their tower. Uh, somebody's going to get up on the couch. Somebody's going to try to fight the curtains. Somebody's going to get in the Christmas tree. I'm not taking this down this year, you guys. This is me acknowledging that this does not come down. This is the Christmas tree. It lives here. Um, so however bad you're feeling about your pandemic, um, house cleaning or housekeeping, I need you to know that this has been up since like 2019. Um, so this month's topic is, like we said in the post, it's kind of a twofer. Um, it is both stuff that you need to be thinking about as you are writing your story or novel, especially novel, and I will get to that in a minute. Um, well, novel or longer novel length work. Um, and it's stuff that as a developmental editor you need to be looking at. Um, and it is the first pass stuff. It's the first things that you look for as a dev editor. When you come in and someone says, here's my story, what do you think? These are the big problems with stories. Um, and by knowing that these are the big problems as a writer, you can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, I have the ESA rates. The Editorial Freelance Association took a poll in actually, I think last year, um, to see what kind of rate range its members were charging. Um, and a lot of freelancers, even who are not members of the ESA, use this as a, a barometer for, for where their rates are. Are they charging too much? Are they charging too little? Um, they'll look at the rate range and they'll say, oh, you know, I'm not doing as in-depth of work. I'll lower it or I'm doing a more in-depth read. I'll, I'll be on the high end of this range. Um, I don't live in an expensive place. I do live in an expensive place. Um, you, that is the reality of the industry. If you live in New York, you're going to be charging on the higher end, and that is fine. That is fair. That is good. Never, never apologize for charging what your work, it, what your work is worth, or what you need to live. Never. <laughs> um, as an editor, y you have to. So, developmental editing for fiction, which is, um, I don't want to say it's the easiest, but it is the easiest. Um, it is the developmental editing that you have to have the least amount of specialized industry knowledge coming into, if that makes sense. Like, um, if you are doing developmental editing on a medical work, um, on a medical textbook, you have to have enough knowledge in you to spot the big problems and to say, oh, this wasn't even addressed, or 
I know there's a study or a counter study to the thing that you're talking about here. Um, are you addressing this later? Why isn't this in here? Do you have a good reason? And toss a coin to your witcher. And, um, but when you're editing something like, oh, The Wizard of Oz, you already know a tornado can't do that. So we're in fantasy land, and you just have to look for plot holes. Like, why didn't Dorothy, you know, click her shoes and say there's no place like home at the beginning? Well, she didn't know. And so um, despite the fact that there are a bunch of ways to get to and from Oz that are dealt with not just in The Wizard of Oz, but in the, the whole subsequent range of books, um, there there were plot reasons that Dorothy couldn't just, right? Um, there aren't always plot reasons that somebody can't just. Um, I was on a panel review committee um, for a, a, a large convention. I have no idea if this submitted panel is going to be at the convention, but one of the things that the panel wanted to talk about is um, why so many mysteries or science fiction stories um, start with communications going down. And for me as an editor and as a writer, I just feel like the answer to that is really simple. It's because it limits the amount of characters and it solves the, well, why don't they just call the cops question. Um, because if you can call a grown-up, a lot of your story may fall apart. I completely missed throwing the bone into the dog crate last time, so um, we're going to try again. That worked a lot better. So, um, these are the problems that you need to look for. So, so anyway, developmental editing. For fiction, you are looking at $50 an hour. 45 to $50 an hour, um, somewhere between three and 39 cents a word, depending on how dense your prose is. Um, they're gonna get through roughly four to six manuscript pages an hour. And a manuscript page is 250 words. That's standardized across the industry. That's what a page is. So if you just wrote your thousand word story for NYC Midnight and you're sitting on it and you wanna take it to an editor, that's an hour of work that you're asking for from that editor. Um, if they say, here's your problem, and you have to rewrite the whole story, all of a sudden you basically have a new story that you then need to take to an editor. Um, same issue if you have a novel, but it's like compounded because mistakes that you make early on um, things that you forgot, things that you left out, um, a character that your novel then depends on. Um, you're going to have to tear this down. And it is the most exhausting and disheartening thing that you can do as a writer. And it is the most exhausting and disheartening thing to have to tell someone as an editor. So save yourself, save your editor. Christine, save me. Um, <laughs> And, um, and 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 see if you can keep an eye out for these things. I am from forest fire country. I'm just going to front that really early. So this forest and trees metaphor that we're working with in the post is very, very near and dear to my heart. So what we're talking about this month is being essentially the fire spotter. There are people who literally... Um, they used to live in like a tower. You could get paid to live in this super cool tower in the woods all summer. And all you do is sit out there on the deck and read your book and look for plumes of smoke coming up in the distance. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, it is really easy as a writer to get caught up in, is my sentence perfect? Um, is my work perfect? If you're in the Yeah Right Discord server, we did a lot of talking about that this this past week, two weeks ago. Um, we did some workshopping on a piece that someone posted as part of a work in progress, and they wanted to sort of keep editing, keep editing, keep editing, 
And at some point you have to pull the plug on, I'm editing a little part of my piece. Because if you make that little part perfect, first of all, if you have to throw it away later, it's going to break your heart. And um, second of all, there's not a lot of point in sitting in a forest, like pruning and shaping and fertilizing one tree while the rest of the forest gets eaten by, I don't know, borer beetles um, all around you. There's our obligatory dog cameo. Isn't she great? Um, so, you know, you have to pull the plug at some point. Um, I, I wish I could tell you exactly when. Um, there's, there's no perfect point to, t to pull the plug on. But what I'm talking about this month, uh, what we're talking about together, is that you have to start stepping away from those beautiful words and those beautiful phrases and the ideas and this one character that you love to the exclusion of all else and look at the forest around you. Climb that tower, look out, see if you see any red flags, warning signs, plumes of smoke. And we put a big list in the post, which is on this giant screen, which is casting a lot of light on me. I don't know if you can see the reflection. Um, but I'm going to rearrange it a little bit for the, the sake of this meeting so that I can break it down into plot problems, character problems, and meta problems. And I'm actually going to deal with the meta problems first because they are genuinely kind of the easiest to spot. Um, so as a dev editor, when you are reading through a, a story, um, a an essay, I get this in creative nonfiction a lot, actually, um, this problem, which is, is all the information in the story that somebody needs. And fiction and nonfiction approach this problem differently, but they get to the same problem. Fiction is, did you put enough in? Nonfiction is, did you take enough out? Because nonfiction shouldn't be a diary entry. You, even if you're just telling the story of how the spleen goes bad, you're telling a story. People remember narrative hooks. People find that memorable. People like to have a story. People will pack a bond with anything. I still cry when I think about the Mars rover sending its last little message, okay? Like, I, sorry, <laughs> like literally having a moment. It is a robot. It's a robot that somebody programmed it, but also somebody programmed it to do that. So that's intense. Excuse me. A little ASMR moment there with the swallowing. Um, so is all the information that you need to understand the story in the story? It's really hard to do this with your own work, but try. You should always try. Um, if somebody's I think I talked about this last month where Ian Fleming put in the entire description of how to play a card game so that you would know how cool the thing James Bond just did is. Maybe I talked about it in the post. I don't, I don't remember. Um, the point is that if, if there's a piece of information that your reader is going to need to understand what's going on, make sure it's in the story. Don't assume that they just have it or, or bring it to the story or extrapolate it in the story. This happens in microfiction a lot. People edit everything out but the perfect phrases and they've edited the story right out of the story. Story's gone. Um, <laughs> giant pet peeve. Um, the point of view. Is the point of view consistent throughout the story? This one's easy to catch, right? It's easy to catch yourself as a writer. Um, there's a bunch of advantages to different points of view. There's a there's a big post in our resources section about the different points of view um, that we can link in Discord, uh, in the comments on the video. Um, I think I linked it in the post itself. But different points of view have different advantages. You know, first person point of view um, lets you be very intimate with a character um, and it lets you as the author hide information. 
So if the character doesn't have the information, then the reader doesn't have the information. On the other hand, sometimes you need to build suspense by letting the reader have information that the character does not. Um, first person isn't going to work for that. So when you find yourself using a literary device that's incompatible with the point of view, like if you're really, really struggling to convey something in your story, do take a minute and figure out if you wrote it in the point of view that's going to work best for the story. Maybe third person limited is better. Maybe third person omniscient is better. Maybe you need to write the kind of story that can take a point of view break now and then. And it's actually a, a fairly common convention in mystery novels where you will be tight in on the detective for time, 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 and there will be a little chapter break, and it's like, meanwhile, the murderer, and then you go back to the detective's point of view for the rest of the story. And it, I don't know how I feel about it emotionally. <laughs> um, I've seen it done very well. I've seen it done very poorly. Um, but it is a useful device, and it is a good way of conveying information. Um, so point of view. And the last kind of meta thing is Chekhov's gun, which you may or may not be familiar with immediately as a literary convention. Chekhov, of course, is famous for having said, if you put a gun in Act 1, you must fire it in Act 2. So just go through, periodically pull back, climb your tower, look down, and see if there are any big, cool things that you have put in your story that you're not using. And then find a way to use them because they're cool. And some reader is going to be let down <laughs> that you didn't use your big cool thing. Um, or figure out why they can't be used. If you have a pair of magic shoes that will get your character home, and you put them in Act 1, and then she does nothing with them throughout the story, and then in Act 2 she clicks her heels, that's great. We now have, you know, Bomb's shoes. But there has to be a reason why she didn't just do that in Act 1 and end the play, right? So come up with a reason why your big cool thing can't be used. And maybe it's that you're writing in first person, which is great, and your character has no idea, which is great, that they can be used this way until they know, and then they do it, and then your book's over. Woohoo! Go home, wake up. Um, so those are the those are the meta things that you want to look for. And like I said, I I don't want to say I try not to say easy, um, because everything's differently hard for different people. Some people are really talented at seeing patterns. Some people are really talented at um, telling if a character is in character or not. Some people are super talented at writing fight scenes. Um, what is easy for one person is not going to be easy for another. But these are the most mechanical things to spot. So they take the least amount of um, practice, which isn't to say that they don't take practice, but they take the least amount of uh, nuanced experience to spot. So is the information there, is the point of view right, and have you fired the gun? I'm going to set character aside for just a second. Um, I love characters, honestly. I get along with all humans, and I understand how humans work perfectly. That is my strength as an autistic person. No, it is not. But um, the plot, um, these are things that are going to break your heart at some point. You are going to go back and you are going to look at an old story that fell flat for everyone but you, and you're going to be like, why, but why, but why? And then you're going to read it with this editorial eye, and you're going to say, oh, really? Really? I'd oh, oh. Um, and it's like when you hand something to your editor, and they hand it back, and they're like, so 
it's like when the plumber comes over to your house to look at the drip under the sink and then they make that like expensive noise when they come back out. They're like, do, 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 do. Okay. Um, so I, there's no kind way to say this, but does anything happen in your story? Does anything happen? Does it? Um, the number of stories that I have read uh, as a judge, as a submissions editor, as an editor editor, um, that are beautiful stories by incredible writers, except for this one little thing. And as as we go into this discussion, I want to be really, really clear that something happening does not need to look like Campbell's hero's journey. Um, there are incredibly valid traditions of storytelling that are not rising action, climax, falling action. Um, there are a lot of ways to tell a story um, that is literally about someone sitting on a beach and having that experience. That is a story that can be told. But you should go into telling that story intending to tell that story. If you find yourself having told a story where a character sat on a beach and had a feeling, and what you intended to write was an action-adventure science fiction story, you have a problem. Um, Character makes a decision is a valid rising action, climax, falling action, something happens. But in a longer story, character makes a decision might be like not enough to hang your whole plot on. Um, you know, it, it can be. Um, goodness knows, there, there are so many. Uh, stories where it centers around the decision to have a baby or the, you know, the decision to choose this or that, right? Like everything comes down to, to the, the crux of that decision. But if you thought something happened in a scene, pull back, look at the scene from above, imagine it without all of the thoughts and feelings that your character is having. Did they just walk into a room, turn around twice, and then leave? Because I have definitely read stories that were supposed to be, um, it was supposed to be about a character's experience at school or something, right? Like the, the character processing this. But for some reason, they were written in this framing where the character actually like walked into a room, looked at a photograph, had a feeling, and left. And those can leave you a little flat as a reader. If you go back and you're like, this was really, really pretty, but what was what was supposed to happen here? Nothing nothing changed. The character didn't necessarily have a realization. The character was like, I remember this happened. And then they're done. Um, make sure something happens. Something happens. Um, and like I said, there's, there's a couple ways to do this. As you as you climb your tower, as you look out for your smoke, one um, one big plume of smoke could be: is your story set in the past, but you started writing it in the present, and now your present character has nothing to do? Consider just writing the story from the past. Like you you may not need the present character. Um, What is your character doing with their hands or their body during this scene, and do they have to be doing it? Um, I sat down and made a spreadsheet once, literally, that just sort of had – it walked through a scene. It had what is the character doing, what are they thinking about, what are they feeling about that. And the what is the character doing column was very, very little. And I was like – maybe since this is in a longer novel, they can have this thought or feeling in conjunction with doing something else that they genuinely have to do to forward the plot of the story. Um, which brings us to pacing. 
when you have a lot of segments where very little happens, all of your action can end up crammed into these little slices. Um, and in a short story, that means that all of your action is crammed at the end, almost always. And when you turn in a short story where all of the action happens at once and then there's no denouement, your reader is going to think that you ran out of room. Whether or not you ran out of room, your reader is going to think that you ran out of room. So pull back, look at your story, at your novel. This is another one that is not as heartbreaking in a novel because you can often like kind of each those events around and be like, oh, this happened. Let's just make it happen two days before that so that we don't have three weeks of space where nothing happens, but we're describing meals and walking and walking and meals. And I'm looking at you two towers. Um, even even the two towers, though, like if you look at the book as a narrative structure or the movie, I guess, if that's your thing, I have issues with Peter Jackson. Not all of them are, none of them are elves at home, Steve. That was great. That was cinematically cool. I don't, I don't care. Anyway, um, so he was like, Tolkien was like, nobody wants to read about two hobbits walking across the world. And it, of course, it turns out that people definitely want to read about two hobbits walking across the world. So he went on and wrote The Hobbit, which is about a hobbit and some dwarves walking across the world. But he interspersed it with let's pull back and look at what's going on in the big world hobbits still walking let's pull back there's a battle going on hobbits still walking let's pull back and look at the bigger politics of the picture hobbits still walking and then you get to the third book um the hobbits spoilers the hobbits do a lot of walking in that one too um so pacing have you spread your events out you don't want everything to happen at the same pace because that's also boring. If you're like, here's one event a day, like that's, that's super, super boring. But if you are spending the same amount of time describing every day, despite the fact that everything happens on this day, this day, and this day, your pacing's off. What you want with pacing is you want to give the scenes that are important the most words and the most room to breathe. You want readers to be able to focus on those and immerse themselves. And when nothing's happening in your story, you don't have to make a lot of words happen, right? You can just sort of gloss. Um, you can say, for the next two weeks, we accomplished this, this, and this. And there are ways to write that, that, that give it some space and some interest, but don't necessarily like bog your story down in Monday, we did this. Tuesday, we did this. Wednesday, we fought the kobolds. Thursday, we did this. Friday, we did this. Saturday, we fought the dragon. Sunday, we did that. You know, that was boring, even though there's a kobold fight and a dragon fight. For the first half of the week, we delved deeper and deeper into the dungeons. It got darker and darker and darker. On Wednesday, we finally ran across the kobolds. Long description of kobold fight. See what I mean? totally different. Um, so pacing. One way to think about pacing, if you are a synesthetic learner or a synesthetic thinker, is that if you've ever heard the sounds of a roller coaster, where it goes tick, that's how you want your pacing to go. Or it's an option for pacing that you can, you can sort of hear the speed of the train on the tracks for pacing. And that's something that's actually, um, uh, I keep like pulling in these pop culture references, but that's, I mean, that's who I am. That's what you're getting. Um, in uh, Mad Max Fury Road, a lot of the music uses train sounds to both impress on you the 
the size of the world and the vehicles, um, especially the war rig, which is a huge converted uh, semi-trailer that the characters drive in for a lot of the movie. But the the theme music for the war is... And as you... As the action in the movie speeds up, so does the... And so you get this sort of driving, and you can do that with your words. You can absolutely do that with your words to drive the pace faster and faster and faster until everything feels like it's about to tumble, and then you have your climactic scene, and then you kind of start to recover. Use your train noises. You know, use your train noises in your head. I, I don't know. Whatever works for you. Just don't write your whole story at the same pace. And don't write your whole story at the same pace and then have a little chunk of breakneck speed while you try to wrap everything up that should have happened throughout the rest of the story. Those are both going to cause you to have to do a lot of rewriting. There's something that you can look for. That's um, a mechanical cue. As a developmental editor, one mechanical cue that you can look for that somebody is about to have a pacing problem is that their paragraphs will start the same way. They will have a lot of, here's a short prefatory phrase and then the rest of the sentence. Um, I am not entirely sure how to give you an example of that other than, you know, on Thursday, we went to the store. On Wednesday, we went to the store. Um, that's, a, that's a terrible example. I will come up with a better example later. I, 3 a.m. tomorrow morning, you know, the time that, didn't exist this morning because daylight saving time. Um, still better about, I will never not be better about daylight saving time, y'all. Um, and, and wait till it's summer. And I am angry and bitter about summer because summer is the worst season. Um, anyway, so the other thing that is really just going to tear your story apart is stakes. Um, I mean, not like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, stab, stab, stakes, but consequences. Actions have consequences. In Lord of the Rings, if we do not put the ring in the volcano, the bad guy takes over the world. Um, the stakes don't always have to be that high. And in fact, if you are writing more than one story set in a... Um, universe, a world, please do not make the stakes that high in your first story, looking at you, Jim Butcher, um, who, who took it to 11 by like book two, and all of a sudden, like, there's nowhere left to go up. There's, there's just no room. And so we're caught in this never ending battle to somehow increase the stakes, even though the stakes are the end of the world every single time. Um, So you end up saying the end of the world, but also everyone you love dies. And it's like, I feel like that's wrapped into the end of the world, isn't it? Maybe a little bit, maybe not. Maybe that doesn't, that's not what the end of the world implies to you. So are there stakes? What happens if your character chooses wrong? What happens if you don't accomplish this goal? Because a lot of times, like, I will be reading a story, as, certainly as a submissions editor, definitely as a judge, where a character is trying really, really hard to do something that there are no consequences whatsoever for not doing, that they don't even necessarily want to do. I have no reason to believe that this character is interested in, um, to avoid throwing any authors under the bus, I'm going to give you an example of when I do this in real life. Um, I, back in the before times, <laughs> when we, uh, when we could have parties and things, um, I was more or less known as someone who would bring cool food to a party. Um, to this end, I would tie myself in knots for days before a party, trying to figure out what I was going to bring. 
and getting more and more and more ambitious with it. Um, these were not even necessarily potluck parties. Nobody had asked me to bring anything or nobody had asked me in particular to bring anything. It's like a Super Bowl party, bring whatever. Um, I could have shown up with chips and that Fritos bean and cheese dip that is like straight up crack. Like if you have not had the Fritos bean and cheese dip, it's, it used to be my favorite thing in the world, and then I discovered Vegemite Cheesy Bite, which you can't even get outside Australia, um, which is mean Australia, hoarding the Vegemite Cheesy Bite. Um, anyway, but I could have shown up with chips and dip, and, and everyone would have been happy. I didn't have to show up with five dozen meticulously crafted artisanal cocktail jello shots. I didn't have to show up with... 12 kinds of puff pastry with six different fillings um, for vegans, vegetarians, pescatarians, meat eaters, uh, people who couldn't have gluten, people who couldn't have lactose. I didn't have to do that. Nobody was asking me to do that. Um, and so I would get myself wound up to the point where I would be up at like 2 a.m. cooking and crying. And um, one day my I, it was not a day it was a night it was late at night my now spouse turned to me and said honey what happens if you don't though and I was like what he says, does anybody even know that you're planning to bring three kinds of baklava and I said well no and he said what happens if you only bring one kind are people going to be super happy that there's any baklava or are they going to be like where's the other two kinds of baklava I didn't know you were making and I said well but they're going to be they're going to be happy with the one kind because it's, it's good and he said, yeah you can stop now there are no stakes for stopping there's no consequences here and I see this in stories all the time where a character so obviously like it's, it's realistic it's relatable but as the author, it's your job not to treat that like those are real stakes. That is your character's problem. That is not a problem your character is trying to solve. That is a problem that is internal to me slash your character. Um, and to resolve it, they need that climax, the what if you just don't, um, which is very Bartleby the Scrivener, right? Like, I prefer not to. And there's no consequences. There were no consequences for Bartleby. Nobody made there be consequences. And that was a story about there not being consequences, um, about the stakes being really lower than people thought. Um, so you, obviously you can write that story and it can be hugely famous, but um, you know, know that that's the story that you're writing going in. Don't think that you're writing a story about a guy who heroically chooses not to do anything at his job, which is the most terrifying thing that could ever possibly happen in the world because the world will end if you don't do anything at your job. No, it's, it's about if you don't do anything at your job, the, the world will not end. That, that, that you didn't matter to that job. <laughs> so are there stakes? What happens? Think about it. What happens if your character fails the test? Think, every time your character tries to do something, you have to think about, you don't have to, you should. Um, I mean, I'm not your supervisor. I'm just a person who's been doing this for a while. Um, think about what happens if the character fails. And realize that the character, unless you have written it so that the character doesn't, the character understands what the consequences for failure are. And the character is assuming that you have made a whole person of the character, which we're going to talk about in just a second. The character is smart enough to figure out that if there are no consequences for not doing a thing and they don't want to do it, they probably just not going to do it. And then to make them do it, you have to kind of puppet master them. So give them a reason to do it. Make there be consequences for failure. Make there be a prize for success. You know, what does what does success give them? A lot of times I'll see a character striving to do something and it's just like they're they're trying really hard, but 
the thing at the end they have no reason to want or be interested in. And the thing that happens if they don't do it is, if not actually preferable for them, is at least not detrimental to them. And people under those circumstances don't do things. We, we all have couches and TVs and phones, and we are going to lie on our couch and watch the TV and play with our phone. Um, be aware. And it's, it's totally fine to write a low-stakes story. Please do not take this as me saying the stakes have to be the end of the world in every story. Like I said, you got to you start somewhere, you know. Um, and emotional stakes are stakes, too which is why advice on the internet is generally terrible because a lot of people who jump in to give advice don't give the character slash original poster credit for having thought through what the stakes and the consequences are and decided that this is the better outcome for them. So when people are like, well, why don't you just quit your job? I, I assure you, the OP has thought through what happens if they quit their job and they don't have another job lined up. They don't, they won't have health care. They, so they are choosing to do this thing that from the outside may look detrimental to them because they have examined the stakes and that's how people work. That's how dogs work. My dog cries. I give her a bone. I have now taught my dog to cry for bones. Go me. Um, and I can't even stop because it just works reliable for her on the second Sunday of every month, whatever. Um, when we were training her to go in her crate and to have that as her safe place, we didn't punish her for going in there. Then the stakes for going in were too high. We didn't, you know, there's consequences. And there were consequences for us too, right, if we didn't, if we didn't crate train her. Um, mm. Excuse me. All right, so this consequences for the wrong decision leads into the first big character issue. And this is a character issue that is very hard to spot um, as a writer. It's either really hard or really easy to spot as, um, as a dev editor but readers are really sensitive to it. And readers are really sensitive to it because we have talked about the Mary Sue and Gary Stu tropes to death. We've talked about them so much. And one of the takeaways that a lot of people have from that is that you have this sort of infallible character and they don't necessarily want that. And don't get me wrong. I want the characters to win. I want your characters to win. I want them to do well. I want them to succeed and to achieve their goals. Um, but I want to care about their goal. I want to care about why they're doing it. Um, I want them to care about why they're doing it. And I want there to be room for the character to be wrong. You have to make room in your story for your character to be wrong, or there isn't any satisfaction when they're right. If your character chooses correctly every single time and the climax of your story is your character making a choice, this is a very suddenly low stakes moment for the reader because they have no evidence that your character is going to choose anything but the right thing. Even if the stakes for choosing wrong are the end of the world, how likely is that to happen because your character is always right? Let your characters screw up. Let them be human. Um, make some space for them to make imperfect decisions based on a lack of information. Even if they're super, super, super smart and your story hinges on them being super, super smart, looking at you, Batman. Um, I haven't seen the new Batman movie, guys. No spoilers yet. Please, please. This is the only thing I've cared about spoilers for in the last, like, 10 years. Um but proceeding from 
Bruce Wayne is very smart, we now have to be like, Bruce Wayne makes smart decisions based on bad information, which makes them wrong decisions, ultimately. Um, or you get somebody like Tony Stark, who chooses to test his jet engine over his priceless car collection. That's a bad decision. But you see that he is capable of making bad decisions that have consequences, which lets you, as a viewer, question whether the idea to put a, a giant magnet in his chest to pull shrapnel out of his heart, rather than just having actual surgery, is a good decision. Um, and, and the answer may be Tony Stark makes terrible life choices. I think we all know that Tony Stark makes terrible life choices. Let's just move on. Um, Bruce Wayne makes terrible life choices, too really bad life choices. And Alfred makes really bad life choices. Dressing up as a bat and hitting people is not therapy. Go to therapy, kids. Get your kids some therapy. Um, get your adult self some therapy for the guy who told you that it was okay to dress up as a bat and fight people. Um, some of my best friends are furries. Get that on the table right now. This is not a slam on furries. This is straight up a slam on Get the kids some therapy, please. He's grieving. Um, so characters, can your character be wrong? Um, can your character be a whole human being? You don't have to make a Pinterest board and a complete life story for every character that you have in your story but you should be able to tell something about them. And as a writer, I need, I need you, please, to not send me a story where you haven't approached all of your characters as though they were human beings. Um, as an editor, it is harder to tell if the story that you're looking at has been approached that way. But the plume of smoke that you're looking for is how heavily do these characters depend on tropes? Straight up, tropes are not wrong. It's not wrong to include tropes in your story. It's totally fine. When you include a character that is based on a trope that you haven't thought about or examined, you are probably going to include artifacts of white supremacy in your work. That's, that's, just we, we live in a culture that is steeped with it. Um, a lot of the tropes that we depend on for storytelling came out of times and places where it was not only unremarkable, it was strongly approved. Um, that just is what it is. Throw myself under the bus here. I have a trunk novel that I've been fiddling with for a long time, and it needs a complete makeover because I included some, it's urban fantasy, and I wanted to have a diverse cast, which great, good for me, good for baby me, good job. Um, and to make that cast function, I depended on uh, common tropes about magical systems and who uses what magical system and who does what. And um, they are hella racist tropes, and I have to tear this thing down to the studs if I want it to, to not suck. Um, I, I will front, I could probably put this out and get it published as written, um, and there will be people who will tell me that there's nothing wrong with it. That's not a book that I can be proud of. So, you know, we all make our own decisions um, and, and how heavily you want to, to lean on trips. But if you catch yourself saying, okay, well, I only need this character for one interaction in the Quickie Mart, so I'm just going to reach out and grab a trope or a stock character out of because we do, right? Like we all have stock characters. We have access to these stock characters. Um, 
if you think about it in terms of fairy tale, you have the magical talking animal, you have the birds. Birds almost always do the same things in fairy tales, at least in French and German fairy tales. No, I'm going to include Sweden in that. Denmark. Okay. So fairy tales, right? <laughs> um, we have the old person who lives by themselves in the woods. Um, we have a family dynamic. We have this cast of stock characters. Um, if you have watched Into the Woods, um, please don't watch the new movie. Watch the old PBS recording with Bernadette Peters. It's so much better. It's so much better. And they didn't take out all the good songs and the complexity. Um, there were some choices made with the movie. And I'm just going to say having Red Riding Hood sing that song to the baker was a creepy choice. Um, <laughs> Very creepy choice. Um, but anyway, we have these stock characters, and we do grab them. What you want to make sure that you're not doing is grabbing Apu. You want to grab somebody out of, like, maybe Kim's Convenience, right? <laughs> like, when you reach for a stock character, you bring with them the freight of everyone that's ever used that character and what they've used them for. So if you want to have your immigrant family that runs your quickie mart, which is a trope for a reason, there are tons and tons and tons of immigrant families running convenience stores, um, running bodegas, there's a, you know, great, that's realistic. It's something that happens in the world don't depend on this stock character that has been developed for the white gays in white supremacy, often played as a comedic trope. Take more time to make that character be human. Um, the more tempting it is to just be like, I only need it for one exchange. So instead of reaching for those stock characters, when you only need them for one exchange. Be aware that you have a huge library of developed stock characters that you can use that are just characters from your other stories. You already know everything about them, right? If I need to drop uh, someone in for one exchange um, who is a ship captain, I have someone. Um, if I need to drop someone in for one exchange that is, you know, in the military, I have someone. I have a bunch of stock characters that are from other stories. If I need to drop in a fantasy stock character, I have a bunch. When you start depending on those tropes to build your characters for you, you are really, 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 really rocking um, a, a thin line there um, almost always just because your readers are going to read that character as the trope and they know how that trope has been used it's a trope for a reason right like um, you know if this one actor always shows up in blackface if you put them in your movie everyone's that freight comes with them you can't just make a Chris Pratt movie and not have everybody be like, okay, but. So that's, um, pretty much, pretty much it for this month's big topics, right? For the, you know, what, what are the giant plumes of smoke that are rising out of your forest? Can you see things? Are you, are you spotting things? Is everything that you meant to put in coming through? Um, what is going to keep you from having to tear your story all the way down to the studs and redo the insulation, put the drywall back on, and rebuild it? Um, and as a dev editor, what are the signs that you can spot early on that you need to tell someone with the deepest regret in your heart <laughs> that they have a fundamental problem with their story that is going to be an extensive enough rework that their story is not ready for copy editing. It's not ready for line editing. 
they need to actually sit with this story and think about how they can fix this. And as a dev editor, you may have some suggestions, right? Like saying, okay, well, we have your racist Quickie Mart character. This is going to be a fairly easy character to replace. Um, here's some reading that you can do on the problems with that character, and you can see if you want to keep this style of character and address those problems, or if you want to think about shifting that character to something else, which is going to have its own problems, but at least it's not this problem. And you can maybe head those problems off at the pass. Um, the the pacing stuff again but this is why you do a developmental edit right this is why you do this before you start copy editing before you fall in love with your phrases and your perfect sentences before it takes you christine three days to send me one sentence because you wanted the perfect word uh, i <laughs> stick your tongue out at me um but it you know and then we're going to edit that sentence out, right? Like it's it's going to be part of, okay, nothing really actually happened this week. So despite the fact that we went through this sort of scene by scene to figure out what happened, we're now going to compress it into one paragraph to save our pacing. Um, why we do dev edits. Um, I am going to unpin myself from here. And we've got a couple minutes left in the meeting and I think, ooh, I've pinned you. That's exciting. Um, <laughs> I am not sure if we've gone to speaker view or gallery view here. But um, let's just let's let's talk about some of the problems that have come up because we we see these all the time, right? Like, like what's my my biggest sin is probably the tropes because I have to come up with so many characters on such short notice because I want to populate these worlds and I love world building um, and and finding all of those characters and their tropes is like it's why I depend heavily on my stable of sensitivity readers. Yeah. Um, the, my biggest problem, as you know, is always uh, making sure something happens. I like my characters to have feelings. And uh, so they have a lot of feelings. They don't always do a whole lot of stuff. Um, so like finding that what will nudge them into action is always uh, a trick for me. Yeah, it feels like that's something that like, I think what problems people have depend a lot on how they start their stories because I know you start your stories a lot of times with like, I know about this character and a feeling that they have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's usually um, where my stories come from. And I know other writers talk about the, well, when I see this prompt, I think, oh, I've got to go get the thing or open the door. And so they end up doing a lot of like info dumping and, and action heavy writing, which is the the same problem. It's just the opposite mm -hmm. problem, right? Like they have not particularly fully developed characters, but they have incredibly like things happening, things happening, things happening. Um, but happening isn't the same as, as a plot developing. Right, yeah. I You know, one of the, I was writing some notes down as you were talking and one of the things that um, I was thinking about is, is um, you know, make, you know, having to do with making things happen, making sure something changes over the course of the story, but also giving the reader enough right white space to kind of process what they've read. So whether you're writing a lot of emotion or a lot of action, if it's go, go, go the whole time, yeah. and, you know, I'm guilty of over the top emotion. And I can write that for pages and pages and eventually yeah, the reader's going to be like, shut up already. Like, that's like, give me a second to breathe and figure out what actually is going on. And so like that for me is, is a really big pacing problem yeah. as well, kind of bringing a bunch of different problems together. And as a reader, it can kind of feel like the author is trying to cover up something in the story too, if it's just go, 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 go. 
um, you start you start skimming. There's no way mm-hmm. to prevent skimming, um, and and you're gonna lose people because they're gonna start skimming, and then they're gonna miss something that was actually important. Mm-hmm. So and that goes yeah. for like info dumps too, exposition when you're talking. If you're giving like this, you know, multi-page backstory of of what happened 20 years ago that led to this point, maybe your um, story is actually starts 20 years ago. Let's just do yeah. that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. so. Um, and that's not like certainly like you and I write a lot of science fiction together. Mm-hmm. Um, current story notwithstanding, <laughs> um, but a, a lot, a lot of science fiction, and we do have to do those, you know, a hundred years ago, 20 years ago things. So that that's been a pacing challenge Mm -hmm. ongoing because like how much information, I think the, the way that we ended up solving it in, in our longest piece was knowing the whole thing and having that written sort of as an aside, like 10 years ago, this happened 20 years ago, this happened 30 years ago, a hundred years ago, these people were this ages, these are the important people. And then as events came up, just info dumping the piece of that, Mm -hmm. that the reader needed to know right then, and then trusting them, trust your readers, guys, trust your readers, they're not stupid. Um, Trusting them to retain that and then put it together with the next piece of the puzzle so that they have this whole like historical puzzle that they're solving as they're reading the Action swash their swashes are buckled. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but rather than putting it like front loading it all and expecting them to yeah. remember all of this throughout the whole book, plus um, like figuring who, out where you can drop pieces in. Who wants to like memorize this to understand that? Mm-hmm. Um, another writer that does a really really good job with that is. Um, uh, why can I not? Neil Stevenson mm-hmm. um, in like Diamond Age gives you, it's, he writes these, this is Snow Crash, Diamond Age, mm-hmm. he writes these incredibly info dense books, but he doesn't give you any more information than you need at any one given time to understand what's about to happen next. Um, I love them. They are really info dense. If anybody's thinking about picking <laughs> them up, um, or who else? For revenge. Um, I'm reading uh, Jade City right now by Fonda Lee. She does a really mm-hmm. good job of that. So you get a little bit here, and then yeah, you know, the stuff moves along, and then you get a little bit more, and it just provides more and more context and I'm not done with the book yet so I can't tell you how it all pans out but but like your knowledge of the whole situation just kind of grows like this yeah being yeah handed a whole bunch of stuff it's really clever really it clever. also it, it makes you feel smart as a reader to be given those little pieces mm-hmm. as you go it makes it makes you feel really smart when you put things together even though like you're clearly just being <laughs> like, <laughs> but it keeps legit. you turning but readers page. love it right like yeah it keeps this this sort of underlying mysterious hook can keep driving. If you run out of want to know in the main plot, the reader is still going to want to know this badly enough to carry them to the next point mm-hmm. in the main plot where they want to know. So it's, it's actually like having that dual pacing track works really, really well on a narrative level. Um, what else? Oh, character responses. I wanted to talk specifically with you about character responses <laughs> to things. Um, speaking of my notes, because uh, it's, it is so hard writing solo to come up with character responses. And I feel like this is one of the times that having a dev editor or writing partner is just critical mm-hmm. to, to bounce off because dialogue or, or, you know, how does a character respond in a given situation? How do characters talk together? You know, what, what happens if a situation occurs and then your character, like, is your character still in character? And it, it's really but, hard when you know both sides of the conversation mm-hmm. in your head already. Like if you're writing both of these characters and it, it can get stale because you have this, you, 
as the writer, you already know what both people are going to say. Yeah. So there's less spontaneity um, sometimes, or it can have less spontaneity. Yeah. The other, the other one that we bump into is when you know the next thing the character needs to do to move the plot along, which is the problem that you're having in the book that we're working on mm -hmm. right now, is that you keep making the character do the next thing, mm -hmm. whether or not she would want to. Yep, yep. And that's that is it, it's a struggle it's a it's a struggle to kind so of hard. it's it's that like you know like, like the gaming term you know player knowledge versus character knowledge right yeah um i have all this player knowledge that my character doesn't necessarily have and i'm having a hard time separating those two things out which makes yeah. it hard to write a, a fully realized and believable character that is responding appropriately as they would in the particular situation yeah, yeah. Or, or they're doing things and expecting the other characters to respond mm -hmm. in the way that moves the plot along, even though they have not given the other, excuse me, other character a reason to do that. Right, yeah. And I think like that's a big chunk of dev editing is are the reasons right? Mm -hmm. You know, are the motivations there? Do we have the stakes? Do we have the, the characters? And it's not really that hard to reform a lot of those things, but you have to be able to spot them. Mm -hmm. And it's it's faster if you spot them while they're happening. <laughs> well, like the train story, right? Like the, that's almost a novella length, isn't it? Uh, it's 5,000. Is it? It's yeah, longer 5, than <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not. <laughs> no, it's, it's a really good length. It's, um, it's neither too long nor too short for what it's trying to do. But I remember that was something that we struggled with is that like we knew what characters needed to do, but not why they would do them. Mm -hmm. And then finding the, you know, the piece in the backstory or the external stimulus that would lead the character to do that. Like finding ways to, to put that in. Right, because it's not, it's not a bad thing to know what your character needs to do. Right as long as you can justify why they are doing it. So like, if you have a story in mind where you're like, this character really needs to throw a ring in a volcano, you need yeah. to be able to, you know, they're not gonna do it just, probably no, they're I mean, not gonna do it just for, like you need to give them a reason to. in the to. Shire, everything's fine. Right, yeah, they, exactly. So it, it's one thing that, because I often write, you know, I have an image in mind, often it's how I want a story to end. Cause I, you know, I have this, idea of this great yeah. moment or whatever and writing to that you know it's it's good to have that that goal in mind but every step along the way you have to make sure that your character is doing what makes sense um in order to get there yeah yeah otherwise uh, that's the other thing it's like you get attracted to these these moments like we were so attached <laughs> to a lot of mechanics um and and this this big reveal idea sort of part way through um the book and it just like we have stumbled into this why why didn't they just mm -hmm. and now the first like third of the book needs to be torn down and rewritten and um again <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm feeling very resistant <laughs> yeah. I'm really oh. so resistant um what I need to do is like find a day when I don't want to invoice and just do that <laughs> to procrastinate. Anyway, um, that has run us up to time for this meeting. Um, and I think I've addressed everything. I know that we're going to have questions coming after this from people who weren't able to make the meeting for one reason or another, um, who wanted to see what I got through. <laughs> which tells me that maybe I wrote the post okay. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll, we'll catch up on Discord. Um, we'll catch Put up. Put some of the links that we mentioned uh, in, the, in the YouTube and, uh, description and also on Discord, so. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I'm trying to think what all I mentioned. Oh, well, I'll just watch the recording. That's why I'm in <laughs> I wrote them down. <laughs> oh, oh, you're, why are you so smart? Anyway, um, 
Thanks, everybody, and we will see you in April when we talk about something else exciting that I haven't started writing about. No, um, the big, big errors, the holes, the gaps, the pitfalls in your writing, the traps that you're falling into, and the traps that you as an editor can help keep writers out of. Sounds exciting. <laughs> I like it. <laughs>